Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the time stamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the time stamping is also given in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article analysis. This first news article discussion is about the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019. The discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. We have been seeing and discussing for past several days about the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019. Yesterday it was introduced in Lok Sabha and it was also passed in Lok Sabha. We have already discussed the provisions of the Amendment Act on 5th December based on the bill that was introduced in January 2019. So we request the viewers to have a look at it for better understanding. Now this bill which was introduced yesterday has the same provisions with some additional provisions also. As already discussed the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019 amends the Citizenship Act of 1955. The basic objective of the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019 was to facilitate the granting of Indian citizenship to members of six minority communities who migrated to India from three countries before 31st December 2014. These three countries are Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. And the six minority communities which are mentioned in the amendment bill are Hindu, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis and Christians. Now those members who migrated without valid travel documents or the members whose travel documents validity has expired will be given Indian citizenship based on the proposed amendment. Now currently these persons or individuals are termed as illegal migrants by section 2 subsection 1 clause B of Citizenship Act of 1955. So to change this provision and to include these members this section is proposed to be amended by the bill. Now like this uh, some same provisions are mentioned in this bill also which we have discussed already. So today we will be discussing about the additional provisions which were not discussed on that day. And one such provision is the amending of section 6 of the Citizenship Act of 1955. This section deals with the provisions for citizenship by naturalization. Under this section a new subsection 6 capital B is proposed to be inserted. This section 6 capital B provides for the special provisions for the persons who are covered by section 2 subsection 1 clause B of the 1955 act. Now under this uh, section 6 capital B especially the clause 1 provides a mandate to grant a certificate of registration or to grant a certificate of naturalization to a person who is referred in the section 2 clause 1 section 2 subsection 1 clause b so if other required conditions are fulfilled by the person to get citizenship by registration or naturalization and if the person is also given the certificate for the same then the person is deemed to be a citizen of India from the date of his entry into India. Now this is according to the new provision of section 6b clause 2. Now in addition to this the section 6b clause 3 also provides for removal of any proceedings that is pending against a person under this section in respect of uh, illegal migration or citizenship. So all the proceedings with respect to illegal migration or citizenship is removed for these individuals. Now another important provision that is to be inserted by this amendment under this section is clause 4. According to this provision the section 6b and its uh, clauses shall not apply to the tribal area of Assam, tribal area of Meghalaya, Mizoram or Tripura which is provided as per the 6th schedule to the constitution. Now if you see the constitution in article 244 under part 10 of the constitution this article envisages a special system of administration for certain areas which are designated as scheduled areas and tribal areas and the fifth schedule of the constitution deals with the administration and control of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes in any state except the four states which are the state of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram. In addition to this the sixth schedule of the constitution on the other hand deals with the administration of the tribal areas in the four northeastern states of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram. Now these scheduled areas are treated differently from the other areas in the country because they are inhabited by aboriginals that is by natives who are socially and economically backward so special efforts need to be made to improve their condition. 
therefore the whole of the normal administrative machinery which are operating in a particular state is not extended to the scheduled areas and the central government has a somewhat greater responsibility for these areas now based on this sixth schedule to protect the aboriginals or the natives this section 6 capital b which is inserted by the constitutional amendment bill of 2019 will not be applicable to the tribal areas of assam meghalaya mizoram or tripura then in addition to this this section will also be not applicable to the area which are covered under the inner line which is notified under the bengal eastern frontier regulation of 1873 now we will discuss about this inner line permit in the next news article discussion now moving on to the next amendment there is also a proposed amendment which amends section 18 of the principal act that is the citizenship act of 1955 this section deals with the power to make rules it provides for provisions in relation to the powers of the central government to make rules for carrying out the purposes of this act that is the purposes of citizenship act of 1955 now the new provision which is proposed by the amendment is to make rules which will mention the conditions restrictions and manner for granting certificate of registration or certificate of naturalization under subsection 1 of section 6 capital b so the certificate which is granted under this section will be based on the conditions restrictions that will be provided by the central government through certain rules then finally the amendment also tries to amend the third schedule of 1955 act this schedule provides for the qualification for naturalization under the 1955 act now on that day that is on december 5th when we discussed about this particular provision we have mentioned it strongly so kindly correct it based on this discussion on that day we saw that the 2019 bill amends one of the clauses in the third schedule we saw that it amends clause d under this third schedule now the point which you have to note here is that this clause is not removed or totally amended rather another provision is being inserted along with this clause and this provision is for the persons who will be granted citizenship by naturalization based on this amendment but if you see the current provision that is the clause d of third schedule according to this the qualification for naturalization of a person is that during the 14 years immediately preceding the period of 12 months in which the 12 months precede the date of application the person has either resided in india or has been in the service of government of india for an aggregate period which amounts to not less than 11 years if this condition is satisfied then that person is qualified for naturalization now to understand this provision let us take one example assume that there is a person a who wants to acquire citizenship by naturalization and he wants to acquire citizenship by naturalization under this clause d then that person he or she should apply for uh, getting citizenship under naturalization now before that application date for a period of 12 months that person should have either resided in india or should have been in the service of government in india or the person could have partly resided in india or also partly has been in service of a government in india so either for 12 months he should have resided in india or for 12 months he should have been in the service of a government in india or partly six months this and six months this also then also this provision is applicable now in addition to this that is preceding this 12 months in the 14 years that person should have either resided in india or been in the service of uh, government in india or partly both then this period in which the person has done both or either of these should amount for 11 years for example the person resided between 2000 and 2014 in india just imagine that if the person uh, resided in india from 2000 to 2006 then he left india then after that that person came back in 2009 then till 2014 he resided in india then this time period is six years plus five years and it amounts to 11 years so based on this the person can apply for naturalization under this clause and if a relatively same condition is also present if the person has been in service of a government in india then also the person can apply for naturalization under this clause and it is also applicable if the initial six years the person resided in india and then later five years the person was in the service of a government in india 
Now the amendment made to this provision was this 11 years period has been reduced to 5 years for the persons who will be granted citizenship based on this amendment that is for the persons belonging to the 6 minority communities from those 3 countries. So these are the amendments which are proposed by the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019. Now this bill has been called as an historic bill by our Union Home Minister. He also noted that this bill sought to complete what the Nehru Liaquat Pact could not do. So what is this Nehru Liaquat Pact? This Nehru Liaquat Pact is the agreement between India and Pakistan regarding security and rights of minorities. This pact was signed in 1950. This pact was an outcome of the six days of talk between India and Pakistan. At that time, the Prime Minister of India, Sri Jawaharlal Nehru, and the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan, wanted to ensure the rights of minorities in both countries. And most importantly, they wanted to avert another war. See, this is because the partition of the subcontinent into India and Pakistan in 1947 resulted in communal rights. And in December 1949, the trade and industry between the two countries was cut off. And followed by this, in 1950, Hindus from the then East Pakistan, that is the present day Bangladesh, and the Muslims from the West Bengal crossed the borders. That is, Hindus came this side and the Muslims from the West Bengal went to the then East Pakistan. So, at this time, there was a violent atmosphere which resulted in uh, lethal attacks on women and children. There were also some brutal killings which affected the minorities in both the countries and they felt insecure because of these conditions. So that is why many Hindus and Sikhs left Pakistan and came to India. And on the Indian side also the same condition prevailed. So to solve the situation, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Liaquat Ali Khan decided to solve the issue. Based on this, the Prime Ministers of two countries met in 1950 and they signed an agreement to safeguard the rights of the minorities. Now this pact is what is known as Liaquat Nehru Pact or Nehru Liaquat Pact. Now, some of the objectives of this pact were to lessen the fear of religious minorities and to put an end to the communal rights and to create an atmosphere of peace. It was agreed that both the governments will ensure complete and equal right of citizenship to their minorities and they will also ensure security of life and properties to their minorities. This pact or this deal also included provisions for ensuring full fundamental human rights which included the right of freedom of movement the right of freedom of thought and expression and the right of religion etc so based on this pact the two prime minister vowed to not violate the rules of the pact and they vowed to make all the efforts to reinforce it and if the minorities faced any problem then it will be the duty of both the governments to redress their problems without delay in short, we can say this pact agreed to guarantee full right to their respective minorities and to accord them the status of citizens. So this is the background about the Nehru Liaquat Pact. Now, according to our Union Home Minister, this pact could not attain the expected results and this will be fulfilled by the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2019. Then we also know that there are many opposition to this bill and they are calling this bill as unconstitutional because uh, under this bill, citizenship is granted based on religion, so it amounts to religious discrimination. And it also violates equality before law and equal protection of law, which is provided by Article 14 of the Constitution. But our Union Home Minister has noted that this bill does not violate Constitution. It is because the bill is based on the principle of reasonable classification under Article 14. Now, we know that According to Article 14 of the Indian Constitution, the state or the government shall not deny to any person the equality before law and the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. Now, this provision is applicable to all persons whether they are citizens or foreigners. But Supreme Court held that where equals and unequals are treated differently, then this Article 14 does not apply in that condition. So based on this, even though the Article 14 forbids class legislation, it permits reasonable classification of persons, reasonable classification of objects and transactions by the law. But these classifications should not be arbitrary, artificial or evasive. Rather, it should be based on an intelligible differential and substantial distinction. 
based on this only the union home minister is claiming that the bill is not unconstitutional and it is based on the principle of reasonable classification that the citizenship is proposed to be granted in addition to this there is also one another reason for the introduction of this bill it is stated that the religious persecution of minorities happening in our neighboring countries is a reason for this citizenship amendment bill in this context our union home minister has noted that since india has given refuge to everyone without exception at various points of time in history now it is time to grant citizenship for those refugees moreover he also added that other neighboring countries like uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka were not mentioned in this bill because these countries are not theocratic states. We use the word theocratic when we want to denote a system of government in which priests rule in the name of government or they rule in the name of God. So according to our union home minister these two countries are not theocratic states and there is no religious persecution in these countries also. And we also know that there is one another major allegation against this bill which is uh, this bill does not apply to Muslims. In this context it is also noted that the genuine objective of the citizenship amendment bill is not to protect the minorities but to exclude one particular religion that is to exclude persons belonging to the muslim religion so based on this only those who oppose this bill are saying that the bill amounts to religious discrimination regarding this also our union home minister has noted that the bill will not affect indian muslims or their rights then another criticism with respect to this bill is that this bill only mentions about three countries and six minorities from these three countries so sri lanka is not mentioned and myanmar is also not mentioned so from this uh, we can say that the bill completely ignores sri lankan tamil and it also ignores the rohingya muslim refugees now based on this only the opposition is stating that government is preoccupied with its uh, hatred for muslims that it has not included other countries and also the muslim religion so that is all about this news article let us move on to the next news article this discussion is based on inner line permit the discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference before discussing the news article let us first understand what do we mean by inner line permit this inner line permit is based on the bengal eastern frontier regulation of 1873 see in the british india there were quarrels and serious disturbances between the british subjects who lived in the plains and the tribes who lived across the frontiers and these quarrels or disturbances was especially in relation to the traffic in wood wax ivory cotton and other jungle products because these had great competition in the trade market so in order to prevent such occurrences the government felt that it is necessary to prohibit the british people who are living in the plain from going beyond a certain line and this line shall not be passed without a pass or license so based on this the inner line regulations which is known as the bengal eastern frontier regulation of 1873 was the first law promulgated in assam for the peace and governance of certain districts on the eastern frontier of bengal so this is the background of this inner line permit so as a whole we can say that this inner line permit is a kind of official permit that is prescribed by government for entering into any area within some states this ilp regulates the visit of indians to particular states so what are these states under the section 2 of bengal eastern frontier regulation of 1873 this inner line permit system is still prevalent in north eastern states they are arunachal pradesh mizoram and nagaland so the inner line permits are required by indians who are other than the natives of these states for entering into any place in these states so that is why we are saying citizens belonging to our country from other states require ilp for visiting these three states and the main aim of ilp system is to prevent settlement of other indian nationals in the states where the ilp regime is prevalent so that they can prevent and protect the indigenous population or the tribal population now recently we discussed about this ilp with respect to the citizenship amendment bill because uh, one of the provisions of that bill is not applicable in the ilp areas that is it is not applicable in arunachal pradesh mizoram and nagaland and this news article is mentioning that the state of manipur will be brought under the inner line permit system and this can be done by 
an executive order which will extend the ilp to the state of manipur so that means if the ilp is extended to manipur also then the provisions under citizenship amendment bill of 2019 will not be applicable in manipur so that means the bill only be applicable in some parts of tripura and assam because based on the provisions of the bill the bill is not applicable in the tribal areas of assam meghalaya mizoram and tripura so from this discussion what you should know is what do we mean by ilp and under which regulation this ilp regime is prevalent and which are the states that come under this ilp regime so that is all about this news article discussion moving on to the next news article discussion which is about the human development report of 2019 The syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference. Now, this Human Development Report is released by the United Nations Development Program, or in short, UNDP. And this report is titled as "Beyond Income, Beyond Averages, Beyond Today: Inequalities in Human Development in the 21st Century." So, in this context, let us first understand the Human Development Report. This report was first released in the 1990 by a Pakistani economist Mehboob Ullak and an Indian economist Amartya Sen. So ever since the report is released annually. The report releases a number of indices such as it releases the Human Development Index, then Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index and then the Gender Inequality Index. So let us discuss these indices in detail now. First let us discuss about the Human Development Index or in short HDI. This HDI was created to emphasize that people and their capabilities should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a country. So while assessing the development of a country, economic growth alone should not be taken into account. It should also include the people and their capabilities. Hence in this context the human development index can be used to question the national policy choices it can be asked that how two countries with the same level of gross national income per capita can end up with different human development outcomes so these differences can stimulate debate about the government policy priorities so this human development index is a summary measure of average achievement in key dimensions of human development the key dimensions are a long and healthy life then being knowledgeable and then having a decent standard of living the human development index is the geometric mean of normalized indices for each of the three dimensions now in this the health dimension is assessed by life expectancy at birth and then the education dimension is measured by mean of years of schooling for adults who are aged 25 years and more and expected years of schooling for children who are of school entering age so the mean of these two is calculated for measuring the education dimension then the standard of living dimension is measured by the gross national income per capita so this was about the human development index now let us see about the inequality adjusted human development index or in short ihdi now this ihdi combines a country's human development index with how those achievements are distributed among country's population this is calculated according to the level of inequality that is prevalent in each dimension thus the inequality adjusted human development index is distribution sensitive average level of human development so in this you should note that a country with high human development index does not mean that all people in the country enjoy the same human development now this is because of inequality so the ihdi that is the inequality adjusted human development index measures the overall loss to human development due to inequality so when there is perfect equality or when there is no inequality in a country then the ihdi is equal to the hdi but this ihdi falls below the hdi when inequality rises in that particular country so this was about the inequality adjusted human development index now let us see the another index which is released by the human development report which is the gender inequality index or in short gii now this gender inequality index measures gender inequalities in three important aspects of human development these aspects are first reproductive health now this is measured by maternal mortality ratio and adolescent birth rates this adolescent birth rates indicates 
the birth given by adolescent women. Then the next aspect is empowerment. This empowerment aspect is measured by the proportion of parliamentary seats that is occupied by females and the proportion of adult females and males who are aged 25 years and older. And these adult individuals should be with at least some secondary education. Then the next aspect is economic status. This economic status is expressed as labor market participation and it is measured by labor force participation rate of female and male populations who are aged 15 years and older. Now this uh, gender inequality index is based on the same framework as the inequality adjusted human development index and further this GII tries to expose differences in the distribution of achievements between women and men in a better way. It is because it measures the human development costs of gender inequality. Thus, when there is higher GII value, then there are more disparities between females and males and there is also more loss to human development. So, this is the background about the human development report and the indices released by the report. Now, based on this report, we should know at what position India has been placed. Now, in the human development index of 2019, India is ranked at 129 out of the 189 countries. While in 2018, India was ranked 130th. Now, this year, India has scored 0 0.647 and this score comes under the medium human development category. Now, the top performers in this uh, index are Norway which has scored 0 0.954 and then comes Switzerland and Ireland. Then the countries with the least human development index are Chad, Central African Republic and then Niger. Then with respect to the neighbors of our country, the best performers are Sri Lanka and China in which Sri Lanka is ranked 71st and China is ranked at 85th position. Now, in this context, the news article has mentioned that South Asia was the fastest growing region in human development progress. It witnessed a 46 percentage growth over the 1992 2018 period. Now, this is followed by East Asia and the Pacific, which is at a 43 percentage growth over the same period. Now, in this, India's human development index value has increased by 50 percentage it was 0 0.431 now it has come to 0 0.647 during this same period so this places India above the average with other South Asian countries which have scored among 0 0.642 now let us discuss the case of inequality adjusted HDI now in this India's position has dropped by one position to 130 as compared to human development index and India has scored 0.477 only. So, the news article is stating that India has lost half of its progress which was made in the past 30 years. And you can also see that the Human Development Index score for India is 0 0.647 whereas the IHDI is 0.477. So, this indicates the inequality which is prevailing in India. And then when we come to the Gender Inequality Index, India is ranked at 122nd out of the 162 countries. Now, in this context, you should note the position of our neighboring countries because they are performing much better than India when it comes to gender inequality index. In this, China is at the 39th position, then Sri Lanka is at 86th position, then Bhutan is at 99th position and Myanmar is at 106th position, etc. So, even though these countries have scored better than India, it still shows there is a persisting gender inequality in the world. Now, these data are important because the data goes against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because the goal number 5 of the Sustainable Development Goal aims to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls by 2030. So, from these indices, we can say that we are still very far behind in achieving gender equality. And on a whole, the report also says that it may take 202 years to close the gender gap in economic opportunity. And this economic opportunity, as we saw, is one of the three indicators of gender inequality index. Now, in addition to this, the report also projects a multidimensional gender social norms index. Now, this indicates how prejudices and social beliefs obstruct the gender equality. So, this indicates a backlash to women's empowerment that is rather going towards the goal of achieving gender equality, we are going against it. So, that is all about this human development report.
The data provided in this uh, discussion is not only helpful in your prelims examination but also in your mains answer writing. So with this we come to the end of this news article discussion the display practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article discussion which is about the recent volcanic eruptions in New Zealand. The syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference. The news article has mentioned that some people have died in New Zealand as a result of volcanic eruption which happened on Monday and this volcanic eruption has happened in the white island of New Zealand. So in this context from the examination point of view we will see about the geographical dimension of New Zealand and then the fundamental aspects of volcanoes and then also about the white island volcanic eruption which is reported in the news article. Firstly, New Zealand is a part of Oceania continent. Here you should not be confused with Australia country because it is also a part of Oceania continent. And this New Zealand consists of uh, two large islands and several smaller islands. The larger islands are the North Island and the South Island. Then the White Island which is in the news because of recent volcanic eruption is also known as Wakari Island. It is uh, located in the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand and it is situated in the Southwest Pacific Ocean as you can see in this picture. Now this New Zealand is a part of Polynesia group of islands of the Pacific Ocean. Now to know more about the different group of islands of Pacific Ocean which are the Micronesia, Melanesia and Polynesia you can view our 17th October Hindu news analysis because we have discussed in detail about these group of islands. You can refer this video for enriching your understanding. Now then if you look at the location of the New Zealand, it is located on the plate boundary of the Pacific and Indo-Australian tectonic plates. Now here a plate means the part or slab of the lithosphere of the earth and these plates are moving because of the endogenic forces which originates in the interior of the earth and particularly New Zealand is located on the converging boundary of the Indo-Australian plate and the Pacific plate as you can see in this picture. So as a result of this New Zealand is known for frequent earthquakes and volcanic activity. So in this context from examination point of view let us have a basic understanding of the volcanoes. A volcano is an opening on the surface of a planet or moon that allows material which is warmer than its surroundings to escape from its interior. When this material escapes through the vent, it causes an eruption as you can see in this picture. In this, magma is the molten material and the magma chamber which is inside the earth is the source for this molten material. This molten material or magma escapes through the main pipe which is known as the vent. Now once the eruption takes place, it erupts the magma onto the surface of the earth. The outpoured molten material on the surface of the earth is known as lava. So what do these volcanoes erupt? They erupt the molten rocks, hot gases, ashes, steam etc. These eruptions can be explosive which might send the material high into the sky or these eruptions can also be calmer. So it results in a gentle flow of material. Now after the eruptions on the top of the mound you can see the depression like formation. Now this is known as crater. Now the common form of the landforms which have been formed as a result of volcanic eruptions are known as uh, volcanic mountains or volcanic islands. Now some example for uh, these volcanic mountains or islands are Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, Hawaiian islands etc. And from examination point of view it is also important to know the types of volcanoes. Now the types of volcanoes are based on the frequency of eruptions and there are three types. One is active volcano, then dormant volcano and then extinct volcano. Now in this the extinct volcano it has not erupted in the past and there are no signs of erupting in the future. Now it is indicated by an inactive magma chamber therefore it is safe for people. Now some example for extinct volcano is the Narkondam island in Andaman group of islands in India which is an extinct volcano. Now coming to the dormant volcano it is like a sleeping volcano and it has not erupted in the long time but still it might erupt in the future. This volcano is characterized by the slowly filling magma chamber. One of the example for dormant volcano is the Vesuvius volcano in Italy. Then coming to the active volcano from the discussion you could have uh, assumed that this uh, active volcano is erupting often 
and it could erupt at any day now this is characterized by the active magma chamber therefore this is the most dangerous type of volcano now some example for the active volcano is the stromboli volcano in italy and then barren island of the andaman islands in india etc now in the news article discussion we saw about the white island uh, volcanic eruption now this is also an active volcano of new zealand so you can say that it is not safe for people but still this island is a tourist destination and when this volcano erupted on monday 47 people were on it and based on the various news information it was reported that almost five people have died and two dozen people were feared missing and presumed to be dead because of this volcanic eruption so in this discussion we discussed about the geographical dimension of new zealand then uh, we discussed about volcanoes and types of volcanoes with this we come to the end of this news article discussion the display practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next news article discussion this news article is about an important question asked by the telangana high court to the telangana government the high court has asked the government that whether the government followed the guidelines given by the supreme court in the recently alleged encounter of four persons these persons were accused of sexual assault and murder of a young woman so based on this we will be discussing the guidelines given by the supreme court before going into the discussion the syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference now let us discuss the guidelines these guidelines were given by the supreme court in the case law of pucl and another versus state of maharashtra and others here pucl stands for people's union for civil liberties the supreme court issued a set of 16 requirements or 16 guidelines that is to be followed in the matters of investigating police encounters in the cases of death these requirements are to be followed as the standard procedure for thorough effective and independent investigation of such alleged encounter deaths now first requirement is that when police receive an intelligence or secret information about some criminal activities which pertain to the commission of a grave criminal offense then such information shall be reduced into writing in some form this information has to be noted preferably in the case diary which is used by the police station or it can also be noted in some electronic form also secondly if an encounter takes place and firearm is used by the police party and if death occurs because of the use of firearm and because of encounter then a first information report shall be registered and the first information report or FIR shall be forwarded to the court of law then third guideline or requirement is that in the event of death of a person in such an incident or encounter then the next kin of the alleged criminal or victim must be informed at the earliest that is they should be informed as soon as possible then another guideline is that such an intimation about the incident must also be sent to the police officer's family and if the police family needs services of a lawyer or counseling then such services has to be offered after this an independent investigation has to be conducted on the incident or on the encounter this investigation shall be carried out by the crime investigation department or it shall be carried out by a police team of another police station and it has to be conducted under the supervision of a senior officer this senior officer should be at least one level above the head of the police party which uh, engaged in the encounter now other than this the requirement also issues certain minimum standards that is to be followed by the police with respect to such investigation then the next guideline is that while the information of the incident must be sent to nhrc that is uh, national human rights commission or it is to be sent to the concerned state human rights commission now in this the involvement of nhrc is not necessary unless there is a serious doubt that the investigation is not carried out in an independent and impartial manner then the next requirement is that the police officers who are accused in an encounter death case has to extend full cooperation to the independent investigation which is to be carried out by a senior officer 
then another guideline is that if there has not any death happened because of the encounter but the accused has been injured then the injured criminal or the injured victim should be provided medical aid and then his or her statement has to be recorded by the magistrate or a medical officer along with the certificate of fitness here you may think that why such medical aid has to be extended to a criminal this is because of two things one is that the person has to be at least fit in minimum standards so that he will participate as required in the upcoming investigation and court proceedings then the next thing is that extending such medical aid is a part of the right of that accused person because the person is still an accused only the court of law has to say whether he is guilty of committing the crime which will be stated based on the efficiently conducted police investigation and court trial then the next requirement is that a magisterial inquiry has to be conducted into the cause of death of the deceased person this has to be carried out as per section 176 of the code of criminal procedure then the next requirement is with respect to quickly carrying out all the required procedures there should not be any delay in sending the fir or uh, diary entries or witness records or any other records to the concerned court this is also for the police that conduct the investigation of encounter only if these things are carried out quickly then the justice shall be delivered swiftly here the justice could be two things first either yes there was an encounter in which the police were attacked so the police have retaliated only for their self defense now in such case police will be held innocent and their actions are justified with defense now secondly the justice could be that uh, it was found by the investigation that it is a fake encounter or a planned event to kill the person or persons by the police now in this case appropriate legal and disciplinary actions will be taken against the police officials who killed the persons here the problem in police killing is that it means police are taking the authority of judiciary in their hands only the judiciary can give death penalty and not the police the actual duty of police is only to arrest the accused and carry out the investigation not to give death penalty or to execute it that is why such killings by the police are called as extra judicial killings these are extra judicial killings because these are carried out outside the scrutiny of the judiciary now in this case police do not have the power to take someone's life unless that person is danger to the police or any other individual or property that is only in the event of protection of life or in the protection of property or in the protection of other persons the police can use force that can lead to the death of the attacking individual then the next requirement based on the guideline is that once full investigation is done then the final report should be sent to the competent court now after this submission of the final report by the police the trial begins in the court and based on this the supreme court has also held that such a trial must be concluded expeditiously that is as soon as possible the next requirement is that after the conclusion of investigation if the evidence show that the death had occurred by use of a firearm which amounts to an offence under the IPC then disciplinary action against such officer must be initiated immediately and that officer shall be placed under suspension now the next guideline is that if it is proved that an innocent has been killed by the police or it is proved that the police has carried out extra judicial killing in case of an accused then it means that the person was not given a fair trial now in such a case compensation has to be granted to the dependents of the victim who suffered death in a police encounter then with respect to this there is also one common requirement that is mentioned in the guidelines by the supreme court this is with respect to the promotion of the officers who are involved in the incident or even uh, giving or bestowing gallantry awards to them it means that no out of turn promotion or instant gallantry rewards shall be bestowed on such officers soon after the occurrence of such incident now in this supreme court did not prohibit from giving any promotion or gallantry award Supreme Court allows such rewards to the police only when the gallantry of the concerned officers is established beyond doubt. Now establishing such gallantry act will involve following all the procedures that we have just discussed. 
then there is also one guideline which provides for the remedial measures for the victim's family. According to this guideline, if the family of the victim finds that the above procedures has not been followed or if there exists a pattern of abuse or if there exists a lack of independent investigation or if there is a lack of impartiality by any of the functionaries, then they can make a complaint to the sessions judge who has territorial jurisdiction. This jurisdiction is the jurisdiction over the place of incidence, that is the place of alleged encounter. Now, you may be thinking why we are discussing these guidelines. These guidelines are important from examination point of view. Firstly, you should note the case law in which these guidelines were given by the Supreme Court then these guidelines should be known to you while you are writing any answer for a mains question or while writing an answer to an essay with respect to extrajudicial killings. So that is all about this news article. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. This discussion is based on this editorial which is also based on the issue which we discussed in the previous news article. The syllabus that can be linked to this discussion is given here for your reference. Before discussing the editorial, let us understand what do we mean by criminal justice system and how this criminal justice system works. When we say criminal justice system, it includes the law making bodies such as parliament and state legislatures, then the law enforcement authorities such as police, then it includes the court of law, then finally it includes the prison and correctional administration. So, the state of criminal activities in a society depends upon the efficient functioning of all these bodies or all these stakeholders of the criminal justice system. Now, in this criminal justice system or in CJS, the main role is played by the police authorities and the law enforcement authorities. This is because they register the crime as a first information report. They only will arrest and produce the accused and they only will carry out the investigation and they submit the final report or the charge sheet in the court after the investigation. Now based on this charge sheet, the trial will begin in the court. Now, recently there is a huge outcry among the media and among the public that in our criminal justice system, justice is delivered with huge delay. So where exactly is the delay? Our code of criminal procedure requires the police to complete every investigation without necessary delay. The maximum allowed time for the police to complete investigation in a warrant case is around 90 days from the arrest of the accused. When we say warrant case, we are referring to the case relating to an offence that is punishable with death or punishable with imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a term exceeding two years. So why are we saying that the maximum time for investigation in such serious cases is 90 days? This is because once the accused is arrested, he can be held in magistrate authorized judicial custody only for a total period of 90 days. This 90 day concept is applicable where the investigation is related to an offence which is punishable with death, imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a term of not less than 10 years. Now, this is as per section 167 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So, what will happen after these 90 days from the day of arrest? The accused will have the right to compulsory bail. That is, whatever be the offence, he or she has to be released on bail. This means that if police did not complete investigation by 90 days from the day of arrest, then the accused will come out in bail. What will happen when an accused who is alleged to have committed rape or murder or such offences comes out in bail? People will ask why he or she is released on bail. But what people does not know is the person is released on compulsory bail because the police did not complete investigation within that 90 days. So here the blame will be on the police. So now what will happen if police completed investigation within 90 days from the day of arrest of the accused? Then before getting the right to compulsory bail, the accused will become an under trial. That is, once the investigation is completed, the police submits charge sheet, which is also called as final report. Once final report is submitted to the court, then only the trial will begin in the court. So if investigation delays, the starting time for trial in court will also be delayed. And once trial begins in court, the accused will be called as under trial and he will be in prison till the court orders punishment and sentence. And here also there is a concept of bail as a special case. This is as per section 436A of CRPC. This section talks about the right of an under trial to apply for bail once she or he has served 
one half of the maximum term of sentence she or he would have served if she or he had been convicted so sooner the police completes investigation the sooner is the probability for the case to be concluded in the court trial again this depends on the efficiency of the investigation process so when the investigation is better it is easier for the court to fix the charges on the under trial and soon he or she can be punished and sent for prison and correctional administration or in other cases the person can also be given death penalty now in the court the time taken is dependent on how effectively the public prosecutor is putting forward the case of the victim and how efficiently he or she argues intelligently against the well paid private defense lawyer then it also depends on the level of cooperation of the victim as well because in the meantime the victim should not be harassed particularly when he or she is a child or when the victim has suffered sexual assault because if the victim is harassed then the victim may not come forward to the court to fight even if it is their own case so these are some of the reasons within the criminal justice system why justice is delayed in many cases now there is one more thing with respect to a criminal case because the moment an accused die then the case has to be closed why because once an accused or an under trial dies then who will be punished so the case will be closed automatically now in this context academicians have noticed a trend in extrajudicial killings in many such killings all the accused in a particular criminal case will be killed so once killed particular criminal case will be closed that means no more investigation of the particular case is required by the police because the accused is not alive so even if one accused is alive then the police will have to carry out investigation they have to file charge sheet and all the related things have to be done by the police and even if you notice in the recent alleged encounter all the four accused have been killed so these are the points that you should know before we start our editorial discussion whatever we have mentioned so far is only to enrich your understanding about the way in which our criminal justice system works and even our author of this editorial has written this article by clearly mentioning that the hyderabad encounter does not look like an act of self defense from the side of police this means the author is telling that police have planned and has killed the accused see throughout the discussion we'll be saying them as accused in the way as they will be called by the courts this is because their guilt is not yet proved by any court of law and as they have been killed it cannot be proved in the future also now when such incidents happen in such a case there will be huge amount of suspicion on the police now some doubts could be what really happened whether whatever have mentioned in the media is correct or uh, whether they are the real accused or whether these four are the only accused and such many other questions are also unanswered in this scenario now in this context you should note that if an extra judicial killing happens then it is easy for the police to say that it is an encounter to the public but it is really hard for them to prove the same thing in the court of law now author calls this act of uh, extra judicial killings as illegal because it violates the guarantees of due process which is mentioned in the criminal procedure one such due process is that every accused person should get a fair trial here you may think what if many more persons are involved in the recently reported victimization of the veterinary doctor now that the persons are no more so no one can know who are the real culprits and no one can know whether there are other culprits in addition to these accused who could have been behind the sexual assault now with reference to the sexual assault cases there are two issues that affect the mood and temper of public one is the delay in conviction in the cases of sexual assault then there is also low conviction rate in the sexual assault cases the conviction rate is as low as 27 percentage in our country for the offense of rape because of these structural weaknesses the mood and temper of the public is that they are requesting instant justice for the accused now as civil service aspirants our statement with respect to justice should be as mentioned by the chief justice of india that is justice can never be instant while at the same time justice shall be given without any delay also now such a justice is a measure of test of civilization of any country that is why the author quotes the statement made by winston churchill winston churchill has said that the mood and the temper of the public in regard to the treatment of crime and criminals is one of the most unfailing tests of the civilization of any country 
Now this is because in some instances this mood and temper influences the high level authorities of the government. That is why the author mentions that these extra legal or extra judicial killings always take place with the prior consent of the higher authority and that higher authority could be any administrative authority or ministerial authorities. Now in this context the author also highlights the statement which is made by a UN working group on enforced or involuntary disappearances. This working group has noted that guilty officials are generally not punished. In addition to this India is also bound by a UN resolution to train and disseminate the guidelines related to extrajudicial killings. This resolution is titled as Effective Prevention and Investigation of Extra Legal, Arbitrary and Summary Executions. The principles annexed to the resolution is to be honored by all the governments. The UN General Assembly has also subsequently approved these principles. These principles shall be taken into account and they shall be respected by governments within the framework of their national legislation and practices. And the governments shall bring these principles which is mentioned in this resolution to the attention of all the stakeholders including the public. So in this context, author has noted that India has not done much in disseminating these guidelines and norms among our police and security forces. So what are the, some of the suggestions to solve these issues? Here whatever suggestion we prescribe, it has to give a solution for making lawful punishment to the offenders as certain, swift and proportionate. All the three has to be there in every criminal case, at least in every case where a victim is a victim of sexual assault. That is for an offence certainly there has to be punishment and such a punishment has to be given swiftly without delay by the courts. Then such punishment shall be proportionate to the crime or the offence that is committed. So based on this let us see the suggestions given by the author. Now with respect to the cases of sexual assault the suggestion is to appoint experienced senior judges in fast track courts. In these fast track courts no adjournments should be permitted and such courts should be put under the direct control of high courts. The trial in these fast track courts must be completed within 3 months or 90 days. This means effectively at least within 6 months an offender will be convicted and punished. So this is one of the suggestion given by the author. Then in addition to these suggestion we will provide few more suggestions. One is that collection of evidence in cases of sexual assault is extremely difficult and extremely sensitive. For this every police station or police district should have a dedicated woman wing who are trained with adequate technical and psychological expertise to collect such evidences from women and female children. Such teams should also contain psychiatrists and trained psychologists so that they can handle the assaulted women. Then police have to be trained to take such issues seriously and timely completion of investigation must be ensured in such cases and uh, these investigations has to be conducted in an efficient manner. In addition to this proper training of public prosecutors has to be done and they have to be monitored and supervised about how efficiently they carry out prosecution in ensuring that the offender gets the punishment and the offender does not remain unpunished. There is also a concern on low conviction rate in the cases of sexual assault which we already saw. For this proper implementation of the Supreme Court's verdict in the case law of Kishanbai versus State of Gujarat is necessary. In this verdict the court directed the home department of every state to examine all orders of acquittal and to record reasons for the failure of each prosecution case. This responsibility has to be vested with a standing committee of senior officers of the police department and prosecution department. In this the Supreme Court mentioned that every acquittal should be understood as a failure of the justice delivery system in serving the cause of justice. Now this will act as a self correction mechanism within the criminal justice system. So these are some of the suggestions to clear the growing blot in the criminal justice system. With this we come to the end of this editorial discussion. The display practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article discussion which is based on the Jal Jeevan mission and the Bureau of Indian Standards. The discussion can be linked to the syllabus that is given here for your reference. The news article has mentioned that the Bureau of Indian Standards is preparing the ground for strict enforcement of quality standards for the piped water. See we are aware that majority of the people in India especially people in rural areas suffer from inadequate water supply. 
In addition to this, providing safe drinking water to the common public is a primary requirement for ensuring health. So, in order to address this, the center has launched the Jal Jeevan mission few months back. The objective of this mission is to ensure Har Ghar Jal. In this Har Ghar means every house and Jal means water. So, this means piped water supply to all rural households by 2024. That is, by 2024, all the rural households are expected to have functional household tap connections. Now, this mission is expected to benefit approximately 14.60 crore rural households. Now, this mission comes under the Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation, which is under Ministry of Jal Shakti. The mission will focus on integrated demand and supply side management of water at the local level. So, this will include creation of local infrastructure for source sustainability like uh, infrastructure such as uh, rainwater harvesting, then uh, groundwater recharge and management of household wastewater for reuse in agriculture etc. And this Jal Jeevan mission will also converge with other central and uh, state government schemes to achieve its objective of sustainable water supply management across the country. So, we can say this mission is a step in the right direction. But along with supplying good quality water is also important. So, water quality should also be ensured. That is why it is important to discuss the plan by BIS to enforce the quality standards for the piped water. But in this context, the news article has mentioned that it is not sure whether the Jal Jeevan mission will implement BIS standard or not. So, from examination point of view, let us know about this BIS or the Bureau of Indian Standards. It is a national standard body of India. It was established by the Bureau of Indian Standards Act of 1986, but later it was replaced by the BIS Act of 2016. And this act made the BIS as the national standards body. Now, this BIS is responsible for the harmonious development of the activities of standardization, then marking and quality certification of goods. And also know that BIS works under the aegis of Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution. So, through its core activities of standardization and conformity assessment, BIS has been providing safe, then reliable and quality goods. This is provided by minimizing the health hazards to the consumers and by protecting the environment, etc. Now, the standards and the certification scheme of BIS also support various public policies, especially in the areas of product safety, consumer protection, food safety, environment protection, building and construction, etc. So, in the context of today's news article, the BIS standard for drinking water is Indian Standard 10500-2012. Now, this specifies the color, pH value, taste, permissible limit of chemicals such as aluminum, ammonia, etc. Now, according to the news article, the center is organizing a workshop for states regarding the IS standards, that is the Indian standards, then the certification schemes and testing facilities and also the need to comply with these standards. Now, recently, also you would have been seen the reports that uh, there were water samples which were tested from uh, various state capitals and these water samples failed to comply with the standards. And this is dangerous because supplying impure drinking water is worse than not supplying water at all because it has many health hazards. In addition to this, the news article also mentions that the BAS standard for bottled water, which is mostly produced by the private companies, is mandatory. But the BAS standard for piped water, which is uh, largely supplied by the government agencies, is not yet mandatory. So, this shows that there is a negligence on the side of the government. So, this needs to be addressed as earlier as possible. And as a measure in this direction, we can suggest that BIS should work together with the Union Jal Shakti Ministry while implementing the Jal Jeevan mission so that uh, we can ensure not only water supply across the country but also quality water supply to all. And ensuring this is also important from international perspective because sustainable development goal based on this. The goal is goal number six which is for ensuring the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. So, that is all about this news article discussion. In this news article, we discussed about the Jal Jeevan mission, then about the Bureau of Indian Standards, 
and why it is necessary for having quality drinking water. With this we have come to the end of this news article discussion. The split practice question will be discussed in the last session. Now we have come to the last session that is the practice questions discussion session. This question is based on United Nations Development Program. The question asks which among the following indices are released by United Nations Development Program. Six indices have been given inequality adjusted human development index, inclusive development index, gender development index, gender inequality index, global gender gap index, multidimensional poverty index. Before trying to attempt this question, look at the options given below. The first is all the above, then in the other options, some of the indices are given. So, all the above means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, from these options, you can easily say that 1 and 4 is given in all the options. So, that means inequality adjusted human development index and gender inequality index is released by UNDP. And remember that these two index or indices are released annually by the human development report. This human development report releases five composite indices each year. These are human development index, then inequality adjusted human development index, then gender development index, then gender inequality index and then comes the multidimensional poverty index. Whereas the remaining two that is inclusive development index and the global gender gap index is released by world economic forum so here the correct answer to this question is one three four and six which is option c now this next question is also based on human development index first statement states hdi is released by united nations development program yes this is correct second statement states it is a composite index based on three dimensions of human developments such as a long and healthy life being knowledgeable and a decent standard of living yes this statement is also correct these are the three dimensions based on which the human development index is measured the third statement states the human development report was first released in 1990 by a pakistani economist and an indian economist now this statement is also correct because it was first released in 1990 Mahbub Ulaq and Amartya Sen in this uh, Mahbub Ulaq is the Pakistan economist and Amartya Sen is the Indian economist. So after that the report is being released annually. So here all the three statements are correct. So the final correct answer to this question is option D 1, 2 and 3. Now this next question is a question which was asked in 2018 prelims examination and it is based on the barren island. The first statement states the barren island volcano is an active volcano in the Indian territory. Now this statement is correct because it is the only active volcano of India. The second statement states barren island lies about 140 kilometer east of Great Nicobar. Now this barren island is located 140 kilometers to the east of Port Blair which is in the south of Andaman but whereas Great Nicobar is the southernmost region of Andaman and Nicobar and it lies further to the south of Port Blair. So this statement is wrong. Then the next statement states the last time the barren island erupted was in 1991 and has remained inactive since then. Now this statement is wrong because the barren island volcano had been lying dormant that is inactive for more than 150 years until 1991 because in 1991 there was a major eruption then after that it has shown some intermittent activity so there were eruptions in 1995 then 2005 and also in 2017 so that means uh, this statement it has remained inactive since then is wrong and the last time it erupted was in 2017 not in 1991 that is why this statement is wrong so the correct answer to this question is option a one only now if you look at this question this is based on bureau of indian standards first statement states it is the national standards body of india see the bureau of indian standards was first established by the bureau of indian standards act of 1986 so by that it is a statutory body but later this act was replaced by BIS Act of 2016 and this act made the BIS as a national standards body. So this statement is correct. 
The second statement states, it aims at the harmonious development of the activities of standardization, marking and quality certification of goods. Now, this statement is also correct. It is the main working of this BIS. Then the third statement states, it is a statutory body under the aegis of Ministry of Commerce and Industries. Now, since we discussed it is a statutory body, immediately you will think this statement is correct. But no, this statement is wrong because even though it is a statutory body, it is not under Ministry of Commerce and Industries. Rather, it is under the aegis of Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution. So, this statement is wrong. Here the question asks for the correct statement. So the correct answer to this question is option A, 1 and 2 only. Now look at this mains question based on GS paper 2. Justice can never be instant while at the same time justice shall be given without any delay. In the light of the above statement, discuss the reasons for delay in justice and suggest effective measures in order to ensure fair and speedy justice system in India. Now today we had a total editorial discussion based on this criminal justice system. So, based on the discussion, try to answer this question and post your answers in the comment section. We will be giving feedback for your answers within 10 working days. While answering this question, try to add your own viewpoints other than what we have discussed in the editorial. With this, we have come to the end of our all our sessions. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankara IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation.